what I'm going to be doing today, this is a one-shotter, okay? We're just going to go through this real quick um, based on kind of current events happening in the world. And I, I like to do that every now and then to be able to sit down and kind of chat through um, what's going on in the world around us from a biblical worldview. I feel like that's important for us to be able to do. And so to understand different things. Now, this isn't necessarily happening in our backyard, but I do find that it always has a trickle-down effect in our area. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the arrest of Pastor Derek Raymer. Have you guys heard about this? Raise your hand if you've heard about this already. Johnny was the one who told me. Okay, y'all have heard about it a little bit. Okay, so we're going to talk about that a little bit and try to understand exactly why Canada is in the situation that it's in and why we are probably also headed that direction and what we can do to change it. That's my general goal today. Uh, do what? More guns. <laughs> If you can uh, edit that, we're going to edit that out. Dude, we instantly just lost our tax exemption. You know, I'm really just waiting for it, to be completely honest. Like, I'm waiting for the letter. I'm going to frame it. I'm going to put it up in my office, you know, like the IRS letter and all those things. Let's put those 80,000 new agents to work. Let's get that thing going. Anyway, so we're going to chat about that um, today. Also, just a couple of things before we really get rolling. Uh, men's Bible study has resumed. Um, of course, anybody who's a man in the room and capable of transporting themselves to a location at 6 a.m. in the morning is invited to come and participate. Um, I get asked often, can young men come, like kids? Um, I don't really care, but I would say uh, the stuff that we talk about, most people would probably want to land around 12 or 13 or 14 at least before they start participating. Um, I do believe there's also an informal ladies Bible study that's kind of starting right now. I say informal because they're just kind of doing stuff. Ashley, do you know the schedule on that? I can't remember. Is it Fridays? I think it's Friday mornings. It didn't start yet? Okay. So the ladies are going to start getting together Friday mornings, and they're going to be talking through the, hey, look, there's my wife. She knows. Hey, Rachel, when's the ladies thing? Oh, yeah, it is, because it's a throwdown party is what that is. <laughs> when is that? That's March 17th? Next Friday. So not this Friday, but next Friday. And y'all are just kind of talking through what you're reading in the reading plan, right, baby? Yeah. Might watch some occasional videos and things like that. And if y'all wonder what reading plan I'm talking about, it's the one that cycles through our little slides at the beginning. Um, Churchwide, we're kind of doing this reading plan. And I think it's going really well. I'm encouraged by it, you know, like... When I first started, I was like, good grief, six chapters a day. And now I'm like, oh, six chapters a day. This isn't too bad. Because the other ones I was doing was four, like four, four or so chapters. Y'all go sit with mama. Are they ever going to fix it? Nope. They already fixed it once. <laughs> they ain't going to fix it again. They're just going to let it ride. Because it's halfway through it by this point. I know it drives me crazy too. But that's how you know, that's how you know it's, just, it's just some good old boys doing it. Whenever everything doesn't work just perfect, that honestly makes me feel a little better. <laughs> it's, are you serious? <laughs> it's one of, so it's Christchurch Moscow that's putting it out, that puts out this specific reading plan. And, but it's one of their grandchildren, one of like the pastor's grandchildren. That's hilarious. See, we didn't, man, we're, we're just like one generation away, you guys. We can be cool like that. God, man, I need my grandkids to do cool stuff like that. Anyway, uh, so also you're invited to participate in that. So women's Bible study is for women, you know, because we believe that boys are boys and girls are girls. Um, men's Bible study is for men. You can pick one to participate in, and we'll go from there. We're also kicking around the idea of a Palm Sunday picnic um, after church, like at South Park or something. I don't know. David said he might host it at his house, but, you know, we could try. That's a joke. David did not say that. Don't show up to David's house on Palm Sunday. <laughs> or do, just and have fun. You know, whatever. Um, but anyway, I'm, we're kicking around that idea right now. We'd probably do it more like, um, kind of like potlucky in style. We'd probably have a grill out there to make something on it. And then people can bring whatever they want for sides, you know, and we can just bring tables and lop stuff out there. So that's, that's our current idea is like a little Palm Sunday after church picnic at South Park. I think that'd be fun. Get everybody out there, bring some volleyballs or whatever, and we can have time together. Volleyballs. They got that net out there still, don't they? Don't they have that net out there? Yeah. So volleyball, we can kick a soccer ball around. David can embarrass us. All those fun things. It'll be good. All right. So today 
I want to get into what's going on in Canada right now. If you don't know, I'll just kind of fill you in. Um, so there was a pastor in Canada. His name's Derek Raymer. I think I'm saying his name right. Raymer, Reimer. It's R-E-I-M-E-R. That's his name. And in his particular town, I don't know the town, um, in his particular town, they were hosting one of those drag queen story hour events. Oh, yeah. Y'all have heard about this, huh? Yeah, okay. So drag queen story hour is where um, you bring your children to a building and the state grooms them. That's pretty much <laughs> what's happening here. The state and like sexually grooming, like trying to turn them into something. You know, that's functionally what's happening. So anyway, so this pastor, because um, he had... He was courageous and had some bravery, went and protested by himself, from what I understand. There was nobody else there with him. He was just kind of doing his thing. I think maybe somebody was there with a cell phone camera documenting some things. So anyway, so he's there. He protests, um, and he is forcibly removed from the building. It looks like he got roughed up a little bit, to be honest. I couldn't tell from the video, but it looks like he got kind of knocked around a little bit. Anyway, uh, things escalated. And um, the next day, cops showed up to his house and said there was warrants out for his arrest. And he asked, what am I being charged for? And eventually, he was, it's come out that he has been charged with, and apparently this is a thing in Canada, mischief. I don't even know what that could mean. What is mischief? You know, like, I, that seems like a catch-all. And also disturbing the peace. So he hasn't been charged for assault, which means there probably can't be allegations of assault. Um, unless we're talking about the ones against him, because like I said, it looks like he got thrown around. And so what's interesting in all of this, every time situations like this arise, I've found there's a little bit of confusion inside of the church as to exactly how we should handle this. It, was he doing something wrong? Um, how do we as Christians live and operate in a world where it is the world around us is steadily losing their mind? Um, are we, should we be a direct voice of opposition or should we try to uh, live and let live and just be, be at peace as best we possibly can? How do we actually engage? Um, I want to give us some categories today to help us understand more about how to engage the world around us as um, it, you know, I don't know, devolves, destroys itself. And I also want to assure everybody that this is not the first time that things like this has happened. Um, Kingdoms, cultures, they rise to power, they rebel against God, and then they crumble. This happens over and over and over again throughout human history. Governments are very rarely older than several hundred years. They're replaced again and again and again and again and again. And so we need to be able to think through this in a, in a biblical way. So anyway, <clears throat> one of the big questions that I do want to ask, though, is how did we, how did we get here? Now think, think about this. Think about this. Home dude gets arrested in Canada, right? Pastor Derek gets arrested in Canada. Think about with me for just a moment how many people it takes for an arrest to actually happen, all right? So you have the, the charges are originating, from what I understand, from the mayor's office itself of the particular town that they live in, from what I understand. So the charges are originating from there, okay? Now, that means that it has to flow from the mayor's office I assume there's some kind of touch with the city council around there, you know, around away. I assume they have that in place. It has to go through their, you know, whoever their police administrator is, like a chief of police. And then it has to go all the way down to the officers that are actually on the beat. So that means that every single person and entity along that chain of command has to either agree with what's happening or not be courageous enough to stop it. That's crazy, right? We are arresting a guy for a protest. Well, we're not we, uh, Canada is, you know. They, <laughs> they're arresting a guy for functionally just a, just a demonstration. And no one, no one is opposing what's actually going on. Now, obviously, at the highest point, we can say one thing, which is very, very clear, that that government is in rebellion against God all the way down, all the way, at least the layers that were engaged in this particular area. Not to say there's no Christians engaged in their government whatsoever, but there's, from what I can see, nobody talking about it. And what's honestly a little discouraging here is there's not a lot of Christians, I don't know, maybe Christians with, um, with authority that are dealing with the situation either, or addressing the situation. They have commentary on the situation. Not that I've seen. Um, I have a friend of mine... Um, who runs this organization called the Ezra Institute. 
it's a, it's a theological instruction system that actually started in Canada. And when everything went down up there with COVID and they were forcing churches to close, he had to leave. He lives in Tennessee now, and he's still running his things. And he flies people in from Canada to come attend like his seminars and his classes and stuff. Like it's, it's bad up there. I, I was talking to him about what was going on and he was saying, yeah, it's real rough. It's, it's hard. And we're all trying to figure out how to deal with it because he's still got friends and family there and all these kind of things. Like it is Canada, just Canada, Canada, okay? We've got the cartel to the south and the communists to the north. Like, this is crazy. Like, what's going on with the world around us? Now, we all know how things like this end, of course. What happened with the Tower of Babel? They decided they could do what? They could raise themselves up. They were going to make something of themselves, and they were going to build a tower to where? They were going to build a staircase functionally to heaven. Why? Because they were like, we're God. That was the fundamental motivator. And what did God do? destroyed it. That's, this is how it happens all the way throughout history. Pe collective man, centralized power, exalts itself, and the Tower of Babel got knocked down. What happened with Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar believed he was the, the king of kings, and he refused to honor God. And what did God do about that? Y'all remember? God made him wacko. God made him crazy. And what did he do, Wade? Like a cow. He lost his mind functionally for, for a pretty decent season of time and went wild in the wilderness and ate grass like a cow. And eventually God cured him. But there was this thing. God humbled him and brought them down. What happened to Rome? Rome exalted itself as this great kingdom. And then eventually what happened with Rome? They went in on themselves like a dying star and the whole society collapsed. Like we see this over and over and over again. Psalm chapter 2 verse 2 says, The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. And then Psalm 2 verse 8 says, Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Do you see the distinction there? There's Babel and there's Zion, okay? There's the, the people of God and then there's the people of the world. Now, there's another distinction that we can go all the way back to the book of Genesis to get from the same two. Do you all remember what I'm talking about? There's two groups. What are they? The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, right? And what was the promise in the Proto-Euangelion of Genesis chapter 3 that the the seeds will be at enmity with one another. So where does the enmity come from? Who brought the enmity out? God did, right? God placed that there. There will be in our lives this enmity that exists between the people of God and the people of the world and the people of Satan. Let's just say it what it is, right? Uh, the Bible makes it very distinct that if you do not follow the Lord, you follow Satan. You are a son of the devil. That's how the people go around and say things like, we're all God's children. No, we for sure are not all God's children. There are a lot of people that are the devil's children. That's how it works. And one way or another, God wins. Amen? He's going to win. And if you go through and you read the Psalms, He's going to win by one of three ways. He's going to win by knocking their teeth out. The Psalms actually say that. Say that he will, he will break their teeth out. In other words, he removes the threat from who they are. He kills them. It's another way in which God wins. Or they repent and they follow the Lord. Those are the three ways. But one of those three things is going to happen to the seeds of the serpent. No matter what. So the world is, has this enmity. But we're called to do what? To go out and proclaim the gospel with the hopes that some would repent. We're called to expand the borders of the kingdom of God. We're called to, to build the kingdom of God out as far as we possibly can. But the big question mark comes how? All right. Obviously, from this, we can see that our governing structures in the West are leaning away from God as hard as they possibly can, it seems as hard as they will be allowed to lean away. So we need to be able to ask the question, what do we as Christians do? How do, we, how do we fix this issue? Was it wrong for this pastor to intercede the way he did? Absolutely not. He's called, we're called to do what? What do you do with your light? You let your light do what? Shine before men. The Bible gives us explicit instructions to not put it 
away, not put it under a basket, but instead to broadcast it. Whenever Nehemiah, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in the sermon today, whenever Nehemiah is building the walls of Jerusalem, functionally what he's doing is he's creating a a distinction between the world out there and the world in here. And what actually happened, if you notice, if you read the story of Nehemiah carefully, even some people inside of the walls got uncomfortable. Did y'all notice that? That some people inside of the walls were like, hey, uh, we really doing this? Because those people out there are getting more mad at us as we put more bricks on this wall. <laughs> are we really, really going to finish this? Are we really going to make these distinctions, these divisions? But that's required of us. So the people of God have gotten lazy. We've decided that we're never going to engage in a negative way with the world around us. We're never going to tell the world around us to stop and repent Because we've forgotten that that is an incredibly important power of the gospel. If you don't tell somebody that they're in sin, why does Jesus matter? Especially in the world in which we live today. So uh, the evangelism strategy of the 90s, the evangelism strategy of the 90s could get away with telling somebody, hey, Jesus loves you. Because why? Why do y'all think that worked? Of course he does, because there was this religiosity that still existed in the world around us. There was, especially in the South, there was these leftover remnants of religion. You could walk up to somebody in the 80s and the 90s and say, you really need to repent. And there's a strong chance that they would know what you were talking about, right? Today, you walk up to somebody and you say, Jesus loves you. Their response might be like, I know that. But they have no idea what it means. You could walk up to somebody and say, you should repent. And they would say, I think I'm fine. They don't have categories for their sin. They don't have categories for any of these things. We have to get specific with folks. Homosexuality is a sin. Malakoys, effeminate men, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Point blank. This drag queen story hour is you trying to groom children to be like you. You're coming after them in the most sexually explicit way possible. And we're quiet about it. That's crazy, right? Now... I do agree that there should be a degree of strategy, right? I mean, so I'm not saying that we should all be kamikaze pilots. Or do you all follow with me here? Do you all know what I'm saying? Go. What do you say? <laughs> and you know what? We should try stuff like that more often. <laughs> You know, there, there is a... <laughs> you might actually go to jail now. <laughs> he went after him. He went after him. He was like, and see, that's part of the deal. Even inside of the walls, Nehemiah's building a wall between them and the outside, but that's also drawing up issues inside of the city of God too. It's interesting how that works. I mean, whenever you say things like we should confront the sins of the world, there, were, there are people inside of the church who will get uncomfortable with that. Well, that's who Nehemiah was confronting, the people within the church. Within the walls. The brothers mm-hmm. that were okay with it. Mm-hmm. He wasn't going to fight against the, the, the drag queens. He was, he was confronting the people within the, the, mm-hmm. the family that were allowing this stuff to happen. Allowing those things to go down. Yeah, right. And then John the Baptist was over there telling who? John the Baptist went after who? Who did John the Baptist go after? Come, who chopped his head off? He went after Herod. Herod definitely wasn't a believer, right? He went up to Herod and said, hey, you can't do that with your brother's wife. <laughs> you know, John was going after it. So there is a sense. I'm not saying that we all need to be kamikaze pilots and just boom, fly into the city the first shot we get. But we have lost the courageousness, the, uh, the willingness to engage, and I think the ways that we ought to engage. So first off, we have to reclaim that. We have to be able to go in and say, all right, this is something that we need to deal with. Now, how do we do that, though? I think we do it like Derek did, okay? Why is it significant about what Pastor Derek did? Because it happened in his town under his watch. We talked about this in men's Bible study this past week. Whenever in uh, Titus, whenever we're appointing elders, it says, appoint elders in every town, which is very interesting. 
It doesn't say appoint elders in every church. Paul could have said that, okay? But he doesn't. Why? Because there is a sense in which God has placed us in a community, and this community is kind of our responsibility, right? Now, first and foremost, the Bible makes it very clear that we're responsible first and foremost for other believers, right? To Buddy's point, like pull the log out your own eye before you start swinging around out here. All those things are true. However, there is a degree in which we as believers have a town that the Lord has put us in, and we need to look around and fight to serve it. That's true too. Jeremiah teaches that very clearly. But we should also fight to, to preserve it from itself, right? If the seeds of the serpent are trying to destroy the town in which we live, we say, hey, wait, guys. <laughs> hey, wait. What are y'all doing? You're tearing, the, you're tearing everything down. You're destroying yourselves. We're, we're destroying the community. We want to help build something great and strong that's going to last for generations, not something that's going to worship Baal and be, you know, turned into pillars of salt and all kinds of things like that and sulfur and ash. Are y'all following with me here? Now, there is wisdom and strategy, and I don't want to go through and nuance everything out because I don't have time for that. There is wisdom and strategy of engagement, but what I like to do is this, just as a general principle. What I like to do is this. Um... Has the Lord put this in my lap? And if he has, then we got to roll, okay? I, the Lord has given this to me. This is clearly in my hands. If I don't do something, will anyone? Do you get what I'm saying? So like with the, with the abortion doc who moved into town, home chick moved in literally a block from my house where we were living at the time, the blue house over there in the neighborhood. And we're looking around like, is anybody going to talk about this? Is anybody going to say anything about this? Is anybody going to engage about this? And there wasn't. And so it was time to do something. Do you get what I mean? If it falls into your hands, if it is clearly your purview, if it's your responsibility, in other words, if it's within your sphere of influence, then the Lord has called you for such a time as this. If there's no one else to be faithful, be faithful at the stake of your reputation, at the stake of your livelihood, at the stake, whatever. The Lord has given you this moment, so swing. Amen? I, I think that's the, that's the point that we need to get the most. There's other nuances and degrees and all those things like that. But if the opportunity is handed to you, if the responsibility is clearly in your hands, if no one else will pick it up and it's you or nothing, then it's time to roll. And if you don't know if whether or not that's you or no, if it's you or nobody, then, you know, talk to me and I'll help you sort through it when we can figure it out together. But the church has sat silent for too long because we don't know when and how to engage. I think first and foremost, we should engage where our spheres of influence land. Do any of you have influence in Canada? N no. <laughs> okay. But see, this is what happens. We see things on the news that are 20,000 miles away, and we invest all of our emotional energy into these things, and we don't do a dead gum thing about what's going on in our backyard. That's unbiblical. The Bible teaches that we should be focused locally. Think about the way that God set up all the forms of government that God set up. One of them is what? The, the easiest one. Look around the room. It is the government of family. And who is the head honcho in governments of family. Dad and mom, right? But dad's the tip of the spear. Dad's out front. Dad's the, the one out doing things. But mom's in there too. Mom and dad are the ones that are running the, the family. Dad is the, the head, the top hierarchy, and then it moves down from there. Heads of household can also be ladies whenever there is not a man present. Amen? That's how it works. And you know what? The Lord has called you for such a time as this. So let's get to work. Do good things that the Lord's called you to do. We also see the way that he set up the church to work. The church works in a what? In a local model, right? You have local churches. Now, in the New Testament, I do see, and in the Old Testament too, with the terms of synagogues, I do see a model of oversight that is in addition to the local church. Are y'all following with me here? So there's the, there's the local church, but I think a completely independent local church is not a great thing. Are y'all following with me? Because the, the apostles had oversight 
on the churches that were within their purview. They had a structure, I mean, because they're writing letters, because they're governing these church bodies, because they're, they're sending things, they're communicating, they're cooperating together, like all these things are happening. I do think it is important to have some degree of oversight over the church as a whole. I think that's true. But it's hyper-organized first in the local way. You have elders in each town that, that govern the local church, that, that help things stay within the purview. You have pastors and all those important pieces. If you look at Israel in the wilderness, you see that the Spirit fell on the elders of Israel, and they, had, they broke it up into tens, hundreds, and thousands. That's the way they were governed, okay? They, they had a distribution of authority throughout this you know, million-some-odd people in the milder, middle of the wilderness. If you even look at Old Testament Israel, you see that they formed into, so there's Israel, but then with is, within Israel, there's smaller groups. What were the smaller groups? They were the 12, the 12 tribes, right? There's this, and even within the 12 tribes, there was further delineations into families, right? And the, the family heads, the patriarchs of those families, excuse me, the patriarchs of those families were, were where the buck stopped, and if you needed to go higher, you appealed to a judge or a higher authority or an elder within the tribe. Joshua 22 has got good examples of there. Judges chapter 9 has a good example of there. I don't have a ton of time to go through all those different things. But even um, if you look at Deuteronomy 12, 18, it says, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns, in all your towns, that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You see, the Bible's focused on a hyper-local model. This, this strange national model that we've suddenly become obsessed with. Whenever the presidency was designed, you know how much authority that dude had? Like hardly any at all. It, it was more of like a figurehead position than anything else. Now, we fight tooth and nail over who's going to be the president. And let me tell you, it kind of still almost doesn't matter. Because whoever the legislative bodies are, are going to swing for the fences. There's some, in other words, there's somebody pulling puppet strings, and it's, I don't think it's the person in the presidential seat. That guy needs to, all right, never mind. Okay, we're getting distracted. So, <clears throat> Paul in Romans chapter 13 talks about rulers, authorities, servants, there's local government. And I would argue that the governmental model that we're given in the Bible is a um, representative republic. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Not a democracy. It's a representative republic. And that's how the United States was actually originally founded, right? It was as a representative republic. And this is a large part of the reason before suffrage happened that men were the only ones who voted, okay? I'm going to say some, y'all ready? Here we go. I'm going to say some stuff. Here we go. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin for women to vote. Good Lord, please, we need all the votes we can possibly get right now. Y'all go vote. But in a representative republic model, whenever a man went out to vote, what was he doing? He was, he was representing his family, right? And a man who's brought up in wisdom is going to vote for the best interest of his family. He's not going to vote for what he wants, He's not going to vote selfishly. He's going to lay down his life in sacrificial service and say, what's the best thing for my people? What would the Lord call my people to do? And that's going to be where I push the button. You see the difference? And it moved, it scaled up from there. You had, uh, you had congressional representatives, you had senatorial representatives, and those people would collaborate and have bodies. You had judges that were appointed by certain things. It was a representative republic from the start. But you can see... You can see how we got here, though, okay? So we had this government, and I can't remember who said it. I think it was, I think it was old Ben, who, so they came out of one of their sessions about planning the government, and they said, what kind of government have you given us? Was it Ben? Yeah, I think it was Ben Franklin. Okay, I thought it was. And he said to her, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Because a republic also demands a moral center that exists outside of the government, right? It requires it. In other words, if you, if you don't have a moral center, then what does a representative republic eventually become? We vote for our selfish reasons of what we want. We don't vote according to a governing law that exists over and above us. Are y'all following with me here? It demands a moral center. If you don't have a moral center, 
which, you know, we were all Christians. We were a Christian nation. We assumed that it was the Bible in and of itself. That's, that's how it works. Dude, listen, like, America was 100% founded as a Christian nation. I, I, the more that I read, and I didn't used to believe this, straight up. I didn't used to believe this. But the more that I see, it's like, holy smokes, this 100% was founded as a Christian nation. It's mind-boggling, man. It's absolutely mind- In fact, in fact, here's something crazy. You want to know why Catholic schools in- exist in the United States? This will blow your freaking mind. You ready? Catholic schools exist in the United States because when public schools launched in the United States, they were distinctly Protestant. And so Catholic schools rose up in order to give a Roman Catholic option to people. That's crazy. Bro, we were Christian. Talk to your moms and dads, your grandparents. They all prayed in school. They had Bible reading time. They had all these things. It was a distinctly Christian society. But we've moved away. Why? Well, let me say it this way. How? I think we get tempted to look to another place for security as a whole, because isn't that just the human condition? The Lord promises he'll take care of us, but when the rubber hits the road, we get scared, and we want protection and provision from somewhere else, right? Um, I think the easiest thing to point to as an example of this with those stimulus checks that happened during COVID. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Guys, we're closing down the economy for the next year, but don't worry. Papa's going to take care of you. And free money just lands everywhere, right? Dude, it was insane. My family at one point just got a $10,000 check from the government. I was like, how? (laughs) How is this even happening? And I'm like, we only got four kids. What about these folks with like seven? This is crazy, man. And that happened to everybody. But you know what that does? Do what? We see it now. It creates a degree of dependency, doesn't it? Well, if you're going to fix my problem, then I'll just look back to you again, right? I'll, you're going to take care of me. You promised to care for me. You, you promised to, to dress me like the lilies of the valley. You, prom- you see what I'm saying? Like it is, they're taking over the role of God, and as a result, we have this allegiance to a more nationalistic model of government. That's crazy, man. There was lots of different ways that they could have done it. They could have been like, here's some social security money early. LOL. We all know social security is empty. Um, here's, here's less tax burden for you. They could have done it in all those different ways, but they didn't. They wrote checks because money brings loyalty, right? We see that all the time. This is why I say things like welfare is another form of slavery because money brings loyalty. These poor families that are here that just don't know, they don't know, any, they literally don't know any better. They are indentured servants. I, I had a friend of mine back when we first started the church. I was hanging out with him a bunch, and we were getting to know each other well, and, and he was telling me, man, I'm so excited. I finally got on my disability check. And I was like, a disability check? What is that? He's like, I got my disability check, and, and now everything's going to be okay. And I started talking to him about it. I was like, how much do they pay you? And he said, man, my disability check, it's $700 a month. And I remember thinking, like, you could go work anywhere and make double that. You could go work at McDonald's and double that. And I was like, well, can you, what if you go get a job somewhere? Nope, not allowed to work. If I start working, then I'm not allowed to keep my check. That's bondage. That's slavery. That is, I mean, okay, so I'm not saying, maybe there's not someone in a dark room with a hood over their face saying, muhaha, slaves. Like, maybe that's not happening. But maybe it is. <laughs> but at the very least, what's happening is we have the war between the seeds of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and the devil is destroying people's lives. He's making them slaves. And when, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen? And that means, Christians, you are free to work. You're free to work. And now you're free to bring home something and, and have a feeling of contributing and value and all these things. But you see how it, how it pushes that way. Government grants, man, whoo, those are tempting, aren't they? Ooh, you want $100,000, you can have it. But what comes with every single grant? Strings. What's that? Oh, yeah, strings. Lots of strings. 
Well, like, um, I pick on Westminster a lot. I like Westminster. I think it's a good school. I worked there for years. Um, Westminster's got that program where they accept scholarship kids, right? Right, guys? But because of that, you've got certain strings that come along with it. And because of the LSHAA system, like you want to be engaged in sports, the only way to be engaged in LSHAA sports is if you do what? Adhere to common, the, not common core, I'm sorry, the core four principle, which means that they've got a certain degree of, the state now has a certain degree of influence over your educational pattern. Now, that doesn't mean that, like it's still a Christian school, it's still a distinctly Christian school, but there are strings that come with it. Y'all get what I'm saying here? So we had a... <laughs> We had an opportunity to buy a building, and we found out it was going to cost $2 million. And so I was telling the guys, guys, I need you to find me $2 million with no strings. Go. <laughs> and somebody said, a balloon that size always has strings attached. I think it was Lauren that said that. I was like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but maybe, I still have hope, maybe, maybe there's somebody out there that could do that for us. But all these things move us away from what I would call a biblically local representative republic, okay, to a nationalistic deity type government, right? Where you, and like how much debt are we in now? Does anybody know how much the national debt is in right now? 50 trillion? 32. I'm, I'm, that just, hearing those numbers just makes me relax. Doesn't it, doesn't it do that for you? <laughs> That's crazy. That's craziness. But it's because that we're trying to put, y'all, y'all understand what I'm talking about here, right? It's because the government cannot do what God can do. And when you put the pressure on the government to do those things, it will eventually break, okay? It will break. Now, we've got certain things working in our benefit, And so I think it's the Lord's grace that's holding us together. Like currently, the American dollar is the world currency. Did you guys know that? I think that's the only thing that's holding us up. (laughs) Like if it it ever hits the news that something other than the dollar is going to be the world's currency, uh uh-oh, y'all hold on. I think things are going to get wild real quick. We'll be eating grass. (laughs) Yeah, we will. (laughs) It'll happen in a heartbeat. But you see how that happens. Now, this is, not a, this is not a new thing. Israel, whenever they were in the wilderness, so Israel was set free from slavery. You remember that? They were sent out into the wilderness, but now what happened? Now they got to they gotta work for their food again. And what are they saying? The people who used to be slaves being beaten and their children were being killed and all kinds of terrible things like that, what they wind up saying in the wilderness? Man, you guys remember what Egypt was like? We had onions in Egypt. Wasn't that nice? That's, that's, like, that's like us. We say things like, well, the government probably shouldn't be in control of all these things. Well, but health care, though, that's important. If we're not attached to the government, we won't be able to get good health care. See what I'm saying? Well, you see, like we, we, we do things like this. <laughs> Agreed. Like this, yeah, 100%. Well, I, I had this defining moment that happened with me and Marie whenever, you don't remember this, I'm sure, whenever you went in the hospital for like a week, um, we were taking her around to urgent care because we knew something was terribly wrong and we didn't know how to fix it and I had Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time so I walked up to the urgent care I was like, how much is it for my kid to see? We had no money. We had zero dollars. How much is it for my kid to get in? And they said, uh, it's $90. I was like, oh gosh, that's a lot of money. <sighs> okay, I will pay it. And then I hand them my insurance card. They process all the paperwork, and they say, that'll be 180 <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? It's 180 You just told me 90 She was like, yeah, but you have insurance. Uh-huh. And I was like, what just happened? Incredibly, incredibly broken systems. And so I was like, well, then just take it off. And they were like, no, you can't do that because that would be insurance fraud. <laughs> it's like, you guys are wacko. What's happening here? This is insane because of all these crazy regulations. But see, to Wade's point, this is what happens. When we worship the state, when we want the state to be our God, it can't fulfill those things. It can't meet those needs for us. And we're going to have to deal with that. So I think the way forward is simple. I just want to say a few things and then we'll wrap up. I know I'm a little over time today. How do we get out of this? How do we get out of this statist, 
afraid to say anything mode that we have with our disposition towards the government. Um, first, I think we need to think, focus more on na local issues rather than on national or worldwide issues. I think that's important. But there are lessons for us to learn from national and worldwide issues. But don't devote your emotional and energy and expenditures there. Devote them here. Okay? I think that'd be the first thing. Second, I would say trust the Lord and tithe. Amen? Because, like, there's some ridiculous number. This is not the number for our church, but nationwide... There's something insane. I think like 2% of people who claim to be Christians actually tithe. 2%. Could you imagine what we could do if every Christian who claimed to be a Christian actually just wrote a tithe check? We would have schools in every state that taught what we need them to teach. We would have actual hospitals again. Who started the hospitals? Christians. Who started the universities? Christians. Who started the schools? Christians. It was all started by God's people. We could do stuff like that again. It's not that far away. So I think that that would be something. Trust the Lord and tithe. Don't run first to the state. Don't run first to the state. Run to the Lord and trust his promises. God said he's going to take care of you. Amen? So he's going to. And guess what? For your faith to be grown, it has to be tested. And so that means that the Lord's going to put you in some situations where you have to say, ah, you have to be like Jacob. Okay, God, you promised. <laughs> you promised. This is real scary, but you promised. <laughs> so I'm holding on. I'm holding on. And then you go from there. Um, I think you cling to a, a covenantal community rather than a nationalistic community, first and foremost. I think it means that we, insofar uh, as we are allowed to, we say no to the state. I know for some of us, they just deposited the money magically in our checking accounts. Do you guys remember that? You just woke up and you were like, oh, <laughs> It's here. We, we didn't even have the ability to refuse it in some instances. Obviously, voting is very important. Um, I think it, we do need to get back to the point where we are focused more on the lesser magistrates. Lesser magistrate, I'm sorry. Uh, the local government. My bad, my bad, my bad. Um, lesser magistrate is just saying, like, so there is someone who is over you that is an authority. I, and I think we need to be fighting to put Christians in those positions. I really do. I really think that matters. Um, for too long, we voted pragmatically instead of faith-wise. I know that we look around and we look at the Christian options and we're all kind of like, Ugh, oh, well, you know, I, I think we need to suck it up and trust the Lord and try to put some of those people in those positions and the Lord would do things. And we also need to teach our children, raise your kids up in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. And we need to teach and ingrain in our kids now from their youth, trust the Lord, follow him, his ways. And don't just run to the state for salvation. Amen? Y'all got any questions about any of this before I wrap up? Any thoughts? Tell me after. Done. All right, well, let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you that you've given us an opportunity to dig into your word. I pray that you would help us to trust it and to you, and that we would run to you for salvation and not the state. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. See you all in a few minutes.